Free Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Botti in Washington. Today is Monday, May 15, and here are some of the stories we're covering. Ghana's main opposition party chooses former President John Dramani as its 2024 candidate. In the last election in 2020, Dramani Mama was appreciated by more than 1.6 million votes, which clearly showed that the Ghanaian public have had the opportunity to assess the current government and they believe that it's a better candidate going forward. Former Liberian Vice President Joseph Boaka is bid for October's presidential election, gets a boost with an endorsement. Zimbabwe faces a fresh wave of price hikes. The weekend brings more gun violence to Uganda. The ICC prosecutor issues four arrest warrants for war crimes in Libya. The ICC was established to prosecute those most responsible for international crimes, so it should target the very top of the perpetrators of the crimes committed in Libya. And families around the world celebrate Mother's Day. Those stories plus Samson O'Malley sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Former Ghanaian President John Dramani Mahaman has won Saturday's presidential primary of the main opposition National Democratic Congress, the NDC. The National Elections Commission says Mahaman received 98.9% of the vote over his rivals. He is expected to accept the nomination on Monday. In a Facebook post, he called on the party to remain united for the 2024 polls. Mahaman lost to incumbent Nana Akufado in 2016 and 2020. Some of Mahaman's rivals had petitioned to postpone the primaries due to alleged irregularities in the party's voter register. Daniel Amate Mesa is the NDC election director. He tells me that the primaries went well and that Ghanaians believe that Mahaman is the better candidate than the leader of the government in power. The primaries have been very successful. Uh, we had a presidential primary in 275 councils across the country. We have parliamentary elections in 217 councils across the country. And it has been very peaceful, incident-free, also so far so good. It's only one parliamentary result. We are tied and we have to rerun. But all other coincidences in the have been elected to represent their coincidences. What are you looking forward to now for next year? What are the expectations for your party now that you have your presidential candidate? Oh, well, as a party, now that we have elected our presidential candidate, uh, we know from the party perspective, we the guy running. We are not waiting. Grounds have been put in place. Uh, we have some 15 coincidences that we are yet to have the primaries. But alongside that, the presidential candidate who have been elected, who is the leader of our party now, will actually give his success of it tomorrow. And he will, will outline the program going forward. There were some challenges uh, from some contestants in the primary to the process taking place on Saturday. They objected to it. How was that resolved? One of the candidates went to court trying to put injection on the primary because he had a small issue with the photo album. We decided that in order to reach consensus and go ahead with the election, we actually agreed and withdrew the case from court. The former president, uh, John Dramani Mahame, was your candidate in yeah. the last election. Well, why do you think this time around in 2024 that the Ghanaian people should accept your candidate or your party to lead the country. I believe strongly that if you have had the opportunity to look at his performance in the last election, this has been in 2015. In the last election in 2020, Jaman Imam was appreciated by more than 1.6 million votes, which clearly showed that after everything of his, the Ghanaian public has had the opportunity to assess the current government and they believe that it's a better candidate going forward. That was Daniel Amate Mesa, election director for Ghana's main opposition National Democratic Congress, the NDC. He was speaking with us from the Ghanaian capital, Accra. In Liberia, former Vice President Joseph Boakai's bid to become the next president during the October election this year got a boost on Sunday with the endorsement of Grand Bassa County Senator Nyombli Kanga Lawrence. Senator Kanga Lawrence, the leader of the Liberty Party, had been rumored to be on the short list as running mate of both Vice President Boakai and Alexander Comets of the collaborating political parties grouping. 
Reporter Denise Nipson in Morovia tells me that Senator Kanga Lawrence says that her endorsement is based on what candidate can win in October and unite the opposition against incumbent President George Weah. Senator Yombi Kanga Lawrence, according to her, looking at the prospect of forming a winning ticket, it was necessary for her to support the presidential date of Ambassador Joseph Wakai. And she also considered um, what she termed as the long-term decision for the country, that is um, looking at a ticket that will win and a ticket that meets the aspiration of many Liberians and also safeguarding the image of the Liberty Party by going the direction of her supporters, that many of her supporters are in support of Ambassador Joseph Boakai. There were expectations that perhaps this senator, Senator Kanga Lawrence, would go with Alexander Cummings. Did she say why she did not join the Cummings ticket? Yes, she said that Alexander Cummings was one of those who engaged her in terms of going as a running mate. And according to her, she didn't see that necessary at this point in time. She claimed that forming a ticket with a person, that person should meet the the day-to-day reality of the political landscape that is having a self-examination of what is happening in the country and how or what they want to do in terms of direction. And according to her, it will be a disservice to form a ticket with Elizana Cummings of the ANC why Musa Belisi, who is another faction of the Liberty Party, is in support of Arizona Comics. And Arizona Comics, over time, has supported or continue to support Musa Belisi. So she believes that that would have been a disservice to her people by accepting such alignment with ANC Arizona Comics. What has been the immediate reaction so far to uh, Senator Kanga Lawrence's endorsement of the Boakai ticket? Before today's pronouncement, it was then circulated on the social media and in all corridors across the country that Senator Kanga Lawrence was anticipating endorsing Ambassador Boakai. So a lot of their supporters welcomed the decision that yes, indeed, Senator Yombri Kanga Lawrence, who the term as rescue mother, was the right decision to endorse the candidacy of Ambassador Boakai and not forming a ticket with Elizana Cummings. Denise, thank you so much. A, a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me. That was reporter Denise Nipson speaking with us from the Liberian capital, Monrovia. The prosecutor for the International Criminal Court in The Hague has issued arrest warrants for four people in relation to deaths during the 2019-2020 conflict in western Libya. Prosecutor Karim Khan says that the new technology is being used to investigate allegations of unlawful killings and human rights abuses. Reporter Elicia Fokman has more from Tunis. At a meeting of the UN Security Council last week on May 11th, the International Criminal Court Prosecutor Karim Khan announced that four arrest warrants had been issued by judges and that he had submitted requests for a further two warrants as part of an ongoing investigation into alleged war crimes and major human rights violations in Libya. After the fall of longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, the country has been fractured by years of violent clashes between different militia factions and by conflicts. The last between 2019 and June 2020, when the forces of General Khalifa Haftar from the east advanced on the country's capital of Tripoli in the west. Amid the conflicts have been gross human rights violations and war crimes, such as those unearthed in the mass graves of the town of Tahuna, lying to the south of Tripoli. Although Prosecutor Khan is heralding this as a major step forward in achieving accountability for victims in Libya, Jürgen Schur, the head of the law NGO Lawyers for Libyan Justice, explains why he is only cautiously optimistic. So the judges now issued four arrest warrants. They're currently, as I understand it, under seal, and we don't know who is uh, targeted with these um, arrest warrants. But the ICC was established to prosecute those most responsible for international crimes. So it should target the very top of the perpetrators. 
of the crimes committed in Libya. Libya Crimes Watch spokesperson told Voice of America that it is essential that the names of the defendants against whom arrest warrants have been issued are disclosed. Furthermore, we urge the ICC to take prompt and effective measures to issue additional arrest warrants for all other suspects who have been involved in committing war crimes in Libya. With the warrants being sealed, this means that both the identity of the suspects and the crimes themselves are currently unknown. Jorgen Schur said that they could relate to the mass killings in the town of Tahuna in the south of Tripoli, where the Government of National Accords investigators claimed they found 27 mass graves. Human Rights Watch said that between 2014 and 2020, some 338 people had been reported missing. Or, says Schur, they could relate to violations against migrants in detention. Camp. For Voice of America Africa, I'm Elysia Falkman in Tunis, Tunisia. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Monday, May 15. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And still to come on our program, something on Mali Sports. With the value of Zimbabwe's currency falling dramatically by the day, prices are rising and markets are demanding U.S. dollars for goods and services. That is putting pressure on the government to restore stability and what one official called sanity to the situation. Reporter Kuzai Navashe has details. The price hikes are coming with elections due in a few months. Consumers have had their local currency value eroded with an increasing number of basic goods now beyond their reach. Innocent Miko is a Harare resident. As customers, we note that wholesalers and retailers raise basic commodity prices, which corresponds to black market rate, which is always rising. The truth of the matter is that there is no confidence in the local currency. The majority of local wholesalers and retailers now choose to price their items in US dollars rather than unwanted local currencies. The free fall of the local currency, the RTGS, has left many who earn their wages in the currency vulnerable. Obed Masaraure is the president of the Amalgamated Rural Teachers Union of Zimbabwe. He says teachers and civil servants are among those left vulnerable. Teachers are earning their basic salary in the local currency. They are earning their housing allowance in the local currency, their transport allowance in the local currency, even their own pension contributions in the local currency. So what this automatically means is that when the local currency has collapsed as it is done now, uh, they've now been reduced to paupers, and it is now almost a criminal for the government to continue paying civil servants in RTGS. We urge the government to urgently pay or salaries in United States dollar terms. It's a more card for someone to be earning something like 80,000 RTGS. The monthly 80,000 RTGS is equivalent to just over 34 US dollars using today's black market rate. The government has opened the borders for free importation of basic goods and assured the public that more measures are coming to ease the situation. For VOA, this is Kudzai Nawashe from Harare. Uganda suffered more gun violence over the weekend. An armed guard employed by a private security company was arrested after shooting and injuring a shopkeeper while trying to prevent a traffic violator from running away from the scene of an accident. On Saturday, another security guard shot and wounded his roommate following a disagreement. On Friday, a police officer apparently suffering from mental illness shot and killed an Indian money lender, prompting President Yoweri Museveni to demand answers from the police. According to the Sunday edition of the Uganda Monitor, the police officer who killed the money lender has been apprehended. Luke Owishigiri, Uganda's assistant superintendent of police, tells me that the police are investigating the cause. He also says that the police had no confirmation of the officer's mental illness. The incident happened around Parliamentary Avenue building called Raja Chambers. One of our officers went into the premises and uh, shot the Indian National. We don't know what caused that to happen, but uh, we are investigating the matter. 
The officer is, however, on the run. So what about the report here that the officer or the shooter has mental issues? Is that correct? We don't know about that, but uh, he had been suspended from uh, being armed or any duty that involves him being armed. There was a suspension on that on his case. He actually got a gun that belongs to a friend and uh, he went and misused it. So if he had mental issue, I'm sure Ugandans will be wondering now, how does he have a gun and how does he stay in the police force? And you heard what I said about the president asking the police for answer. Why did you not act earlier when you know that the police officer had mental problems? Well, like I said, we don't have any medical report that confirms otherwise that he had the mental issue. I think mental illness is something that is confirmed by a medical report. How do you know that a person has a mental illness uh, apart from knowing that he went for a test from a psychiatrist? And we don't have that report that affirms he went uh, for a test from a psychiatrist and it was confirmed by a government psychiatrist that has a mental problem. We don't have that report. And you can't dismiss someone or retire someone early on hearsay. You must have a conclusive report that this person probably has a mental illness, which is confirmed by a government psychiatrist because he's a civil servant. The last time we spoke, I asked you about the two shootings prior to this one, and I asked whether there was a problem in Uganda with the use of guns to settle dispute. Like I said, I remember you posed yourself like uh, we have gun violence in the country. We have illegal use of guns. We don't have gun violence. People tend to use the, the guns illegally. We have seen this in Karamoja. If you're very conversant with what is happening in Karamoja, where cattle raiders use guns to steal cattle. That was Luke Orishigiri, Assistant Superintendent of Police and Deputy Spokesperson for the Kampala Metropolitan Police. He was speaking with us from Kampala. The world celebrated International Mother's Day yesterday, Sunday, with a call by the United Nations Population Fund for gender equality and adequate health care for all mothers. The agency says many mothers do not get the support they need from their loved ones. In Kenya, we look at the lives of two mothers, one who has a career and one who does not. Maureen Ojiambo reports. Mother's Day celebrates the role of women with children, their maternal and family bonds, and their influence in society. But gender inequality can keep mothers and women out of workforce and schools, makes them vulnerable to conflict and violence, and denies them the right to make decisions about their own bodies and health. Taking time out to care for children slows down a woman's career progression. Kenti Stikolo is a career mother who has transitioned to different careers throughout her life. She shares her story on how she moved from being a teacher and eventually into public relations. Uh, I moved into research. So I worked for the International Laboratory for Research on Animal Diseases as a research technician. And this was a, a fairly easy a career to mix with having children because I'll just be on the bench, I do my science and then get back home. Worldwide, women earn 77 cents for every dollar made by men. The result is a lifetime of income inequality between men and women. As women become mothers, the income and opportunity gaps widen between the two. Tikolo says as a mother, she had to make decisions that did not suit everyone. I did at one point go to the University of Stirling in the UK where I stayed for a year and uh, that was a tough time for, for the family. The children were pretty young and uh, I had to make the decision to take them to boarding school. That was a tough decision. And yet it was necessary because I needed to immerse myself in the new career that I had moved into, public relations. Mothers all over the world go to great lengths to make sure that their children get education, which is key to ending the cycle of poverty and opening up equal opportunities for boys and girls. Monica Chemtai is not a career mother. She lives in the village in Mount Elgon, western part of Kenya. She says life in the village is not easy. It is very difficult, but as a mother, you must be very strong for your children, and you want your kids to feel good. You need to see through those who are in school and make sure they get all they need. The kind of job we do on the farm is very difficult. 
but the produce that I get from the farm really helped me to feed the children, pay for their school needs as well. Despite the challenges, Chemtai says she enjoys her stay in the village. Chemtai is proud of her accomplishments. Her daughter has earned a master's degree. In African culture, mothers are ever overwhelmed with house chores, including taking care of children and the whole family. Tikola advises mothers to choose what is best for them. Mothers ought to know that none of us is the same as the other. And what I would encourage is that uh, just uh, go by your instincts. Caring for children, cooking, cleaning and other unpaid work that keep households and economies running routinely falls on women's shoulders. The data shows that women carry out at least two and a half times more unpaid work than men. However, the work is often not valued or counted. But... It is on this International Year celebration and families around the world have the opportunity to wish the women in their lives a happy Mother's Day. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Jembo in Sacramento, California. <music>